The views and opinions of this program are those of the host guests and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. For over 95 years, we've set the bar. Power, we restored it. Protection, we reinvented it. Record yields, we redefined it. If there's one thing we know at FS, it's that just because something hasn't been done, doesn't mean it can't be done. We're never satisfied unless we take your farming operation to the next level. Run your equipment at peak efficiency and bust the bins this season. Visit fssystem.com. And joining us now here on a Market Talk, it's been a few weeks since we've had a conversation with him and always great to have uh, David Widmar, economist with Agricultural Economic Insights, join us here on the show to give us his perspective of how the farm economy and the markets and more are shaping up and looking. And David, uh, thanks for the time. Appreciate you uh, being back with us here on the show. I hope you're doing well. Always great to join you, Jesse. Looking forward to the conversation. Well, let's dive in, and I, I want to save the overall ag economy and uh, farm income forecast and more here for a, a few minutes down the road in our discussion, because I know we have a lot to talk about there. I just want to start in general, though, with the overall kind of the market picture here. Uh, I know we've had a lot of heat and dryness to finish out this crop across the Corn Belt, uh, you just posted an article on the AEI website about reviewing the summer drought and the weather conditions. I feel like seasonality kind of slipping into the grain markets a little bit here this time of year with you know the heart of harvest in front of us. So just overall, David, what's your kind of perspective on how we've finished out this crop, but also how the markets are, are kind of acting right now? Can you just uh, give us some thoughts there to start? I think a lot of producers are frustrated because they um, were observing the growing season. The growing season wasn't going well, especially for the corn crop. Um, and they were anticipating maybe some rally in the markets. We saw that, of course, in June. But uh, the balance sheet for corn keeps getting bigger despite the USDA or keeps treading water at that 15% stock to use ratio and increase from last year despite lower yields out of each of these updates we've seen through the growing season. Right now, when you look at yields on a trend-adjusted basis, so not the posted yields, it's like a, adjusting for inflation in a way, uh, adjusting for technology, uh, this is the worst corn crop we've raised since 2012. Now, it's nowhere near 2012 magnitudes, but the mm -hmm. idea here is if you would have told us we would have had a corn crop in the 20th percentile, meaning 80% of all crops in history are bigger than this crop on a yield basis, uh, and you would have saw commodity prices over the last nine months, you would have been surprised. Why? Well, we have a lot more going on in the markets. We have a lot of acres. We have this imbalance between corn and soybeans. I think that's going to stick around into 2024. It's already starting to set the tone for this corn soybean price ratio. And usage has just been lackluster. Um, we expect usage to be sluggish when the commodity prices are high. So we have to keep an eye on how much and how quickly usage rebounds in the next few months. And hopefully it's a positive story and we start using some of this corn. But this imbalance in the market um, is not unprecedented, but it's not typical where we have tight soybean stocks, abundant corn stocks. And I think a lot of this goes back to a year ago when the corn price ratio was screaming to corn. Now it's screaming to soybeans. And we'll see how this plays out as we set up for 2023. But it's it's been disappointing, or 2024, excuse me. It's been disappointing, I think, for producers to look at this, this weather situation and the yield situation, but not seeing it translated into commodity prices or the balance sheet because of other factors. Well, and some of those other factors, I think that's a perfect segue into the overall farm economy. I mean, you know, we put in a, a crop that cost us a record amount of money. You know, I, I mean, you think about input prices and, and all those different things and, you know, just looking at commodity prices sag a little bit. I know that's got to be a, a pretty big sticking point for our growers. But, you know, the recent farm income forecasts and the drops that we've seen, you uh you mentioned this to me before we went on the air. We kind of got to look at it uh, through a, a, a different lens, so to speak, because we're coming off of record income levels, aren't we, David? Yeah, we always dive into that USDA farm income and the balance sheet data um, at a pretty you know, narrow level. And the first one is the year-over-year -year change from 22 to 23 is very, very large. It's a decline. Um, and But the overlooked part of this is that the USDA's latest data dump 
pushed that 2022 net farm income higher than they previously forecasted. Mm -hmm. It's about $189 billion. For context, the average or the norm is about $101 billion. So not quite two years of farm income, not double, but uh, very close to it. In fact, it's not just um, 2022, but 23 is still historically very, very strong. Even with revisions coming down the road, it's not going to be a disaster of a year by any stretch of the imagination at this point. And 2021 was really strong. So when you look at the last three years, uh, it's the best three-year run in farm income going back to the 1940s, World War II. So it actually is better than the 2011 to 2013 stretch. The other thing to keep in mind is there's three years of farm sector income accumulated in those three years. And that is the same amount of income that was accumulated in the five preceding years. So we've had a really good stretch of farm income. There's a lot of volatility, a lot of headaches, rising mm -hmm. production costs, rising fertilizer expenses was the narrative for uh, the last couple of years. But uh, in general, the farm economy has been fairly strong. Not every commodity, not every geography, but we've had a pretty good run in the farm economy the last few years. How is the interest rate situation, inflation, that sort of thing? You know, we're talking about the Fed funds rate maybe being 6.1% by the beginning of next year. How much is that side of the equation playing into the farm economy right now, David? What do you think? Well, there is a really great quote out there that says interest rates impact everything in the economic universe. So I think the more appropriate question is to invert it and ask what doesn't higher interest rates impact and affect throughout the Fair economy. Enough. So specifically to farm income, we uh, see a warning sign in that data. So beyond sort of the exciting top strong farm income numbers, interest expense has been creeping up. It isn't, you know, maybe making its way to the top of the, the headlines because it's been a good year, but interest expense in 2022 was uh, the highest going back to the 1990s. And we passed that again in 2023. For some context, um, interest expense is about $11 billion higher than the the norm that we had seen or the average we had seen throughout the 90s and the 20, 2000s and 2010s. Um, it's about 11% higher. It's about $37 billion. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, excuse me. It's about 30% higher and $11 billion uh, mm -hmm. more. And for context, uh, that I mentioned earlier, $100 billion in average income. So if we get commodity prices moderating and we get the farm economy back to normal, about $100 billion in income, that extra interest expense is equal to 10% of that, that slice of the pie. And producers use those earnings to pay family living and service their debt. And so we have a situation here where, again, it's not a three alarm fire, but there's caution signs out there that this higher interest expense is a reflection of the interest rate environment that, that we're in. It's nothing like we've seen in the last three plus decades. And farmers are going to see that when they review 2023 performance and they start making plans and budgets for 2024. We're in a spot that we haven't been in in quite a while. Well, you mentioned making those plans for 2024. And I know a lot of times with your research there at AEI, you, you challenge farmers and ranchers to think uh, differently and, and, and really you know, look at things on their operation as a whole. So, I mean, as we're looking ahead to 2024, we got to think about it right now. I know harvest is in front of us and that's a big deal, but we already got to be thinking about what's 2024 going to look like. So what would you say to folks as they're sitting down and examining things here the next couple of months, David? Well, first off, I think it's really important to revisit our budget projections, our budget uh, plans, uh, Soybean prices aren't all that different than where we were making budgets back in January, February. Unfortunately, corn is a very different story, yeah. a dollar plus difference. And so we want to make sure that we're updating those yields. We're going to make sure we're updating those prices uh, before we go out and make those capital purchases or those pre prepaid paid expenses here at the end of the calendar year. Looking to 2024, got to look really carefully uh, at the corn soybean split. On the soybean side of the scale, we have a soybean corn price ratio that's going to be favoring soybeans more than we've seen in the last few years. On the corn side of the scale, we have really low fertilizer prices. Fertilizer prices uh, from some work we've done about 50% lower on anhydrous than they were a year ago at this time. So really big changes in the fertilizer markets. Uh, we'll see how long those those prices stick around if they don't maybe continue lower but we really have to update those budgets uh because there's going to be a lot of changes heading into that and i think the last piece here that we want to remind folks is 
Um, it's easy to benchmark and to negotiate on our variable costs, our seed, our fertilizer, our fuel, our crop protection. But oftentimes it's those fixed expenses that get us into uh, a, a lot of trouble. So they think about family labor or family living expense, mm -hmm. land and machinery. Those can account collectively up to 60% of our total cost structure. And again, they're hard to benchmark, they're hard to measure, but they have a huge impact on our business. And what we've observed in the last few years is these are the cast cost categories that have been growing a lot and they're going to be ones that we have to get a handle on as we move forward. We're having a conversation today with David Widmar from Agricultural Economic Insights. You can find them online, aei.ag. David, a few other things I want to talk about here, kind of dovetail off what we've been uh, talking about already. I know uh, some of the articles on your guys' website, you've been looking at the farmland boom, and I think that ties into uh, something you just mentioned about capital expenses and, and more and looking at some of those big purchases. Uh, farmland prices still fairly high levels especially i think the i states you know that's that's where my mind goes to when i think about record price levels but uh as you look at this farmland boom in the in the scope of the whole ag economy uh, what stands out to you are we seeing any changes on the horizon at all so it has been a continued uh upward trend in farmland values. Admittedly, farmland values in 2023 haven't increased as much as they were uh, maybe the last years preceding, but still upward clip. So when we hear the idea of farmland market cooling, it's increasing at a slow rate, not actually the temperature isn't falling. Values aren't falling. They're just not increasing mm -hmm. at, at the same rapid rate. One of the things that we have as a concern is the interest rate environment. Now, interest yeah. rates impact farmland values uh, from the cost of borrowing money. That's the one that everyone talks about, but it's also the willingness of producers to pay those for that asset. We call it the capitalization rate, the relationship between interest or the relationship between rental income and farmland values. And despite there's a strong relationship between cap rates on farmland values and the 10 year treasuries, 10 year treasuries have been trending up. They're approaching 4% or more today. But despite this, farm cap rates are still low, around 2, 2.2%. And that wedge is causing us to uh, pause a little bit. Now, there's a lot of ways that could be fixed. Farmland values could come down. Interest rates could come down. But also cash rental rates could go up to offset mm -hmm. that. We have to watch that really carefully, I think, heading into 2024. Because the gap is getting big enough that we need to see uh, – some movement on all three fronts, or we're going to have to see one of these variables change considerably to help close that that gap. So again, it's a situation where um, the other thing we've been watching is there were a lot of farmland sales two years ago when farmland mm -hmm. values peaked. Generally, when there's a lot of land on the market, we get concerned there's not enough buyers to uh, keep the market strong given the uh, the huge amount of sell selling going on. But now we've seen that cool off a little bit. So that could actually be beneficial. A few fewer pieces of land on the market could keep those buyers bidding against each other to keep those values high. David, I should ask as well before we wrap it up here today, just uh, the broad global type picture. And I know that you and I have talked about China and its role in the uh, global ag economy before South America. Obviously, Brazil is expanding their production and, and we have the Russia-Ukraine situation out there too. So there's a lot going on globally that impacts us here at home. Uh, just uh, kind of a thousand foot view. What's your take on the current uh, global ag economy situation right now i know kind of a loaded question for you to wrap up on david but there's a lot there i'm going to try to dance around <laughs> yeah i was gonna say just from your economist view i mean i mean what what are some thoughts you would you would share uh, surrounding that well i think the big story out of china this year is the demographic issue this peak workforce peak population um there's a few ways that we get new demand in agriculture is Higher populations, uh, the wealth impact from wealthier uh, populations buying more protein, and then policy, you know, policy decisions that mean we might be planting using more ethanol, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so China is doesn't have that population story uh, working with it. It's a big population, but we're not going to see growth. We have to see China focus on that income. And that's important because we're talking about their economy slowing, not necessarily a recession as we think about in this country where we have negative growth in the economy, but 
slowing means that adoption of meat might or for a beef consumption might be slowing compared to where it was the second piece i think is worth mentioning if, if i had to pick just a couple um you know that meme, how it started, how it's going? I think we saw how the Ukraine situation started was commodity prices went really high and there's a lot of concern about how we're going to feed the world. And that's that was a legitimate concern. But how it's going the last week or so, we've seen Ukraine's neighbors getting really tired of uh, a short, quick lesson on grain basis is these grain exports are making their way through land into Europe. And there's a lot of frustration with European farmers about this grain that's depressing their local bases and their cash prices. And so we've seen it starting to impact arms trade that Ukraine's been relying on. Um, but when we step one step further back in an article we wrote quite a ways ago, um, the Ukraine supply situation really needs to be two, two components. How is the grain that's in bins moving out into the global markets. That's the Poland story that we just talked about. The second question is, are those local cash prices and is the war and the, the challenges in the supply chains getting inputs into the country, reducing their agricultural production? So one of them is a stock issue. One of them is a flow. Mm -hmm. How much grain are they going to be producing moving forward? And it's the decrease in acreage coming out of Ukraine that has been a bit surprising for us to observe. And we're going to keep monitoring it. I think that has long-term implications for the global ag economy. Uh, if Ukraine is continues to uh, plant and harvest fewer acres, that will have big impacts for global trade flows moving forward. Well, David, always appreciate the time. And I know folks, if they want to look at uh, the articles and the insights you guys have, AEI.ag is a great place to do that. You guys have the premium side as well, the Ag Forecast Network. You guys have a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff available for folks to check out, don't you, David? Yep, get started with AEI.ag. And of course, the podcast season, a lot of yep. folks have been reaching out about the podcast, Escaping 1980, uh, about the crisis during that decade. And the other one that's been really popular the last few weeks is Nothing Borrowed, Nothing Gained, where the money that producers borrow comes from. We talked about how the bank works, how the farm credit system works, um, how the Federal Reserve works, and how all these things come together to impact the interest rate markets and what producers are going to be facing heading into the loan renewal season here this winter and into the spring. AEI.ag is where you can find all the information. David Widmar with Agricultural Economic Insights. Always great to chat with you, my friend. Have a great one, and we will get you back on the show again soon. Thanks, Jesse. And that's going to do it for our show today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.